Hello, um, good evening if it is your evening, uh, or welcome whatever time of day it may be for you. Uh, in the last few days I've been reading poems from uh, a new book of poetry I published just last month called Exploring Right. But I mentioned yesterday that I was tempted to read poems from uh, my first two volumes. The um, first book of poetry I published was in 2013, a volume called uh, A Force That Takes. Um, and then that was followed uh, about four years later in 2017 uh, with, with this particular volume, which has an unusual title. It's called Holding Unfailing. And uh, as you can see, it is very much influenced by my experience of living in China um, since uh, 2007. Um, this beautiful design, um, the, the graphic image, imagery was done, the actual original drawing was done by a good friend of mine called Alex Doherty, who's a, an academic, a literature specialist, a fine art specialist. Um, and th the cover actually refers to a poem uh, I may read later uh, called Guanghua Lu. And Guanghua Lu is one of the main streets in central Beijing in the uh, central business district. Um, and you can possibly see up here the unusual structure uh, is China Central Television, uh, the state TV, the very modern uh, headquarters which was erected in about 2008. Um, and that's uh, very close to where, where I live, actually. Um, and then just at, uh, well, not the bottom of Guanghua Lu, but as you move away from, from uh, the CCTV headquarters uh, towards Dawang Lu, um, there is the China Customs House, or one of the offices of customs, the, the, the customs um, um, or the official customs network, um, and outside of that building, there 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 are these Chinese um, traditional lions. And so, this volume, although there are poems in my first book very much that relate to China, I suppose uh, "Holding and Failing" was uh, a book that more self consciously perhaps looked at contemporary China, at least some of my experiences of it, um, and. That unusual title is partly influenced by a small fragment from Sappho. Uh, obviously, Sappho's poems exist mainly in fragments. There's only possibly one or two that are complete. Uh, and so the book begins with a fragment and ends with a fragment. Um, and this idea of holding onto something unfailingly uh, was partly influenced by uh, fragment four of Sappho's work, which was, uh, this is all that exists of her poem. The, her poems were sort of destroyed effectively by the Christian church, um, uh, but were preserved in Egypt and were discovered in uh, archaeological remains, uh, I believe in the 19th century. There was a great Sappho sort of renaissance then, and, and actually there's quite a lot of painting that tries to depict um, Sappho and the island of Lesbos and her legacy. The only words that exist, at least in translation here from fragment four, are the following. Heart, absolutely, I can. Now, Sappho would never have wanted her poems to be read as fragments, but of course, uh, what survives is, is very appealing and that partly influenced this unusual title, Holding Unfailing. Um, and the poem, however, I'd like to read tonight is, is not directed to, to Sappho, but I just thought I'd say a few words about um, Holding and Failing as a volume because uh, I intend to read a few poems from this and, and the first book, maybe in the coming days. But tonight's poem is called My Last Rites. Um, that might sound a little bit depressing, uh, particularly in our current situation of rising deaths in, in, in England through COVID-19. Of course, a situation where people can't have any last rites observed necessarily, that they members of families can't go to a funeral uh, or at least be near the body of a loved one who's passed away from that virus. Um, but the, this is more of a, um, a humorous poke at death, I suppose. Um, on one level, I suppose it doesn't really matter what happens after someone's 
passed away, what can it do for them? But of course, it's for the memory of those that succeed or want to remember that person. Um, so there are a few requests in this poem for what I would want, possibly at my own funeral. I'm not a Christian. Um, I'm a passionate atheist, um, and or at least an agnostic, but actually most of the time an atheist. <laughs> um, and I, I feel strongly that um, the life we have is this life. And that's why it's so imperative to make the most of it you can if you're lucky enough to have any degree of choice in your life. Um, one of my favourite pieces of music, which is thanks to an influential organ teacher I had as, a, as a, a teenager, is Stravinsky's Symphony of Psalms, uh, which is a, a work that has three movements. And the last movement is called the, the Laudate, the, the part of the, the, the piece that's devoted to praise um, and song. And there's a wonderful recording of this by a Westminster Cathedral Choir that's mentioned here. Um, just briefly to explain, there's an appearance also by, uh, or a reference to the British poet Peter Redding. Um, and Peter Redding passed away actually in 2011. Um, in my first book of Force That Takes, there's a poem called A Postcard from Peter Redding. Uh, because when I was a teenager just beginning to write poetry, Peter Redding, who was actually a friend of the organ teacher I, I mentioned, he first introduced me to Stravinsky and other composers. Um, he enabled Peter Redding to come to my school to give a reading. And um, we, he, he even kindly, uh, Peter Redding was says, looked at some of my poems and didn't throw them in the fire and uh, gave me some positive advice. Um, and so in the first book, uh, a postcard to Peter Redding, or sorry, a postcard from Peter, Peter Redding, uh, is, is a sort of dedication to him. Um, but he's mentioned here, uh, he, of course he had died by this point, um, as also a, a lover of wine. And uh, I've been lucky in, in my life to learn about wine and in, in recent um, months become a master of wine after many years of study and uh, I'm happy to be married to a master of wine. So uh, this was something, although as, as a kid I couldn't share with Peter Redding, um, I've since come to appreciate. And that's about it. Um, but it is, I hope, a more humorous uh, take on death or what might happen uh, after you know, someone has died. I mean, at least if you if you open a book of poetry and you see a poem that says "My Last Rites," you need to have a degree of you know, um, irony, I suppose, to 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 think about what it could imply as a poem, or at least a healthy scepticism that it's not going to be this sort of deathful poem. Um, may, may, no, you know, there may be poets who've written <laughs> poems called "My Last Rites," which are infinitely more depressing than this. But let's give it a go. No, no more introduction. My last rite. There will be a cremation, which is at least considerate, unless by some miracle my organs merit donation. The music, Stravinsky's Symphony of Psalms Three, the Laudate, sung by Westminster Cathedral Choir or, if they are unavailable, the James O'Donnell recording will do. And ten or maybe fifteen cats wandering freely, for those of a feline affinity who may stroke them in their laps. At the wake, all manner of pickled foods and marinated garlic all may smell, and seventeen back vintages of choicest Australian Shiraz which once was said to have made Peter Redding snort with joy. Alongside a punch of mango and freshest mango steam for those who joy without. No priest or functionary, not even a Buddhist at the back, unless he understands the language of cats. No poetry either, not a word of poetry. Apart from one poem in the programme 
for those who do not love Stravinsky, and one for those who do.